name is Crystal. And my name is Gray. And this is Rubbish and Probably a Podcast, a Good Omens commentary podcast where I, someone who has seen the show too many times, and I, someone who only knows the show through Crystal, discuss every single episode of Good Omens. For today's episode, we are discussing Season 1, Episode 1, In the Beginning. Ooh, what a good time! It is a very good episode of a tv show yeah i i agree because i'm so glad you like it because i strong-armed you into doing this podcast (laughs) you sure did well i think i was mostly surprised in that i am not an avid tv show watcher and most of the tv shows that i do watch and like tend to have a very episodic nature you know like there's a plot for one episode and it finishes up in that episode kind of deal. Mm. So this one felt very cinematic in that it felt like a movie cut up, I guess. Like, I don't know how, what the second episode is going to be like, but like the plot, it's very plot heavy and all that crap. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty fun. It's new. And also it's very beautifully made. Like, it looks really good. Yeah, I mean, I think the CGI suffers in later episodes. But yeah, they mm-hmm. definitely do have that Amazon money. Yeah, they have that fucking Amazon Prime budget, baby. It's pretty good. Okay, so for the synopsis of the episode, we'll be taking the synopsis from the fandom wiki. This episode is about two celestial beings, the angel Azuraphale and the demon Crawley. <laughs> it's Crawley, right? They pronounce it like that. It's it's Crawley at first, but it's Crawley now. Okay, Crawley. Cr- like Crawley. 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 Like, okay, like his name like in the garden his name is Crawley and then he transgenderly changes it to Crawley later. So if you don't okay. want to dead name him, you should call him Crawley. Cro- Crowley. <laughs> Crowley. God. Okay. Have gone native and worry when their superiors tell them to prepare the Antichrist for Armageddon. They resolve to secretly join forces to make sure the Antichrist is neither good nor evil, unaware that there was unwitting switch made and the Antichrist is it who they think. This is a really fun episode. It is. I really like how much it clearly comes from a book like a lot of the god narration bits are just like lifted wholesale from the book and like i feel like it brings the structure together very well in a way that like we don't get in season two i knew that it was from a book but i would say that it does obviously come from like a specific narration style or whatever but I mean, I haven't read the book, so I don't know how true this is. It does feel a little bit like the visuals do add a lot to yeah. the story. Yeah, I really appreciated the cards visual. Like, I feel like some people will think, like, that's too much, yeah. I'm not that stupid. But the thing is, I am that stupid, and I appreciate <laughs> knowing how the mix-up happened. I also quite like how funny it is. It's yeah. so funny. It's a very funny episode. In what I assume is a comedic show. Yeah, and a um, funny book. I mean, the thing about like a lot of sh- media that takes from Bible stuff is they kind of like go both ways. You know, some of them can be like like taking the piss out of the Bible kind of thing, and the other mm-hmm. side is kind of like take it super seriously. It's unreal. Yeah. I feel like this one is like, it's funny, it strikes the balance. And I'm not gonna be like, but it respects the Bible. Like, I don't really <laughs> do not give a shit. But, like, it has a sense of, like, being tethered to the concepts that appeal to me a lot. Mm. So, uh, the intro of the show is kind of, is very narrative focused. Like, I mean, the, the narration is the focus of the entire bit. Yeah. And... They're talking mostly about how the world and the universe is formed. Basically, we have these sort of, like, 
very fun graphics that are like Bill Nye mixed with Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as a voice narrates. And it talks about like a few theories regarding the creation of the universe and then says that the Earth was actually created about 6,000 years ago, um, 4004 BC at 9.13 a.m. The voice then goes like, you know, this proves that God does not play dice with the universe. I play an ineffable game of my own devising, which immediately is- I remember this being a fun moment when I first watched the show. Like, what a cheeky little reveal that the narrator is God. Yeah, and then it says that the Earth is a Libra. And I know! And I thought that was funny as hell. It's quite funny. It has also incited- like, there's a lot of people who like to argue about what zodiac signs Crowley and Aziraphale have, and mm-hmm. I think there's like a school of thought that's like, they have to be Libras, because that's when the Earth was created. They're, they're was created, yeah. Yeah, which I understand, but also they existed before the Earth was created, and I mean, I don't have an opinion on zodiac personalities, but like, for everyone out there, yeah, glad that you, you have a line to back you up. <laughs> The thing about me is I do not give a single shit about, like, Scorpio or Libra or whatever. But I care so, so deeply about what year, like, in the Chinese um, oh, yeah. calendar you were born. Wait, fuck. <laughs> okay, what's 4004 BC? What what animal is that? <laughs> um, oh, okay, 4000... Okay, up, okay, let's do... Okay, if we add... Okay... <laughs> I don't know math anymore. This is disgusting. It's because you already did well in your GRE. It's true. I did well in my GRE and then I decided that I was going to forget everything in the entire world. Okay, so 2020 is 4 mod 12. Was the year of the rat. The earth is a fucking oh my rat. Oh god! Wait, that works so well. It's the first. It's the first one. That like the rat won the race. <laughs> That's wonderful. it. Literally, is the first one. Fuck yeah. Okay, thanks, Neil Kamen. That's something I won't thanks, say often. Neil. <laughs> you know what? Maybe that was no, Terry yeah. Pratchett. Thanks, Terry Pratchett. Uh, I'm sure that the um the Chinese zodiac, zodiac was, was very heavily consulted. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> into their um, writing. They decided system. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My grandpa's a rat. Who are the rats in your life? My parents are. <laughs> oh my god, both of them! What yes. a win! They were at the beginning. After the whole li- Libra bit, which I thought was the most amusing thing in the world, and has made me decide immediately that this is going to be a fun show. Hell I, yeah. They they introduce Adam and Eve. I mean, not introduced. Like, they show them and they're, like, out there in the world in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. And we finally, s- we see, like, Crowley as a snake slithering yes. on Fun that fact garden. about his snake yeah. form is that he is a red-bellied black snake, which is a species that originates from Australia society if Crowley had an Australian accent. Um, and oh, another and fun night. fact... <laughs> well, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Just like yeah. Robert Chase. They're just like Robert Chase. Uh, and a thing about the red-bellied black snake is that they're not aggressive, they generally stay away from humans, and that even though mm. they are venomous, there there have been no recorded deaths from someone being bitten by one of them. And I feel like that's so crowly because like as we learn later, like he doesn't like tempting directly. Like he tries to do things that like spread out small amounts of harm over a bunch of different people. So like you're right, no yeah. deaths have been recorded from his bite. So fucking true. This was probably just chosen because of the color scheme, which is a fun color scheme, but, you know, fun fun that the snake personality fits. Also, can I say that for some reason, I always assumed 
because you told me in the past that like Crowley always wears um, sunglasses to hide like the red, the like snake eyes or whatever. Did you and think I that they were red? They were red. Yes. Because of supernatural. Are they ever red? No. Is that just a supernatural thing that I That's just applied just to this That's just a supernatural show? thing. <laughs> Fucking Crowley supernatural has red eyes, but he's a disgusting thing uh, that is not fit to touch my boy. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> Crowley has... He's probably fine. I haven't even met him on the show yet. I love... I love the look of Crowley, and I love the way it changes through the years. Yes, yes. He's a very fashionable little guy. Yeah. The hair changed when he yes. was a nanny. I thought it was wonderful. I thought it was amazing. And also the way the the Aziraphale's actor is called Michael Sheen. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. And um Crowley is David Dennett. Wait, have you had a have you ever encountered David Tennant before? Because you were not a Doctor Who person. Nope. Soon I will be a Midsummer Night Stream. <laughs> no, Wait, it's much no, ado. No, much ado it's about ado. nothing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've been badgering Gray to watch the Tenant and Tate Much Ado for a long time. Um, and these yes. efforts, like, manifested in, like, rewriting the entire script of the play to suit <laughs> supernatural characters and sending them to him, like, half a scene off. at a time every day for a month. And he didn't read any of it, but you know what? I had fun. Yes, that's what's important. I think the way they both act is, especially I think David Dennett, because um, a thing that I know about this show as well is that you really, really, really like Crowley. Yeah, uh, I want I to like, be. I can him see so why. Bad. I can see why, because it's like you know the fun, charismatic. A guy. Yeah. Who's also a giant loser and flop. Yeah. I don't know. He's like, like, towards the end when he was like, oh, the dog isn't here. And then, you know, he gets a call from hell. And he was like, oh, no, 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 no. The dog is here. Never mind. Great, Goodbye. great like, big know, helly hound. Kind of characterization. <laughs> yeah. It's super fun. And he is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so, right. We see him tempt... Eve, who then passes the apple on to Adam, and, right, what he says is, like, this apple will give you, and then it sort of blanks out. What did, what did Bible Snake say to Eve again? I think it's knowledge, right? Yeah, yeah. That tracks. A few, a few things about the theology, or whatever here. Or, right, I feel like this is, this skips over, you know, the most important parts of Genesis, where, like, God yells at them and casts them out and, like, curses the snake or whatever the fuck um, to focus mm. on Crowley and Aziraphale, which I think is fun. Like, <laughs> specifically... Which is so important, yeah. Which is, yeah, this is the important part. Specifically, I feel like I often forget how this part of Genesis ends with, like, the line, like, after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Edom cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. That is not a line that I remember, but, like, I just really like the idea that someone, like, read this and was like, okay, there's two non-human characters in here. There's the serpent and there's this, like, unnamed angel with a flaming sword. And we've decided that, like, they're besties! And that, like, these yeah. two, like, non-human characters who have, like, sort of, like, created humanity as we know it by, like, doing the apple temptation and then, like, guarding the tree afterwards, that, like, they're gonna stay on Earth for, like, thousands of years and like it there and also be besties and in love. Like, it's so fun. Yeah. Do you skip over to the conversation that they're having? Basically, there's, like, an introduction between them. And oh wait, I also Crowley... wanted to talk about how Crowley created misogyny. <laughs> Why? <laughs> go, go on. What? Okay. The thing about this is that um, Crowley invented misogyny. <laughs> like that's <laughs> on him. Like she did that. That was her. Um, in that. Okay, like I feel like like 
I was not there when, like, various people, like, came up with and spread the version of Genesis that we know now. But, like, I feel like my assumption and the assumption of, like, scholars in general is, like, like, people were sexist, so then they, like, wrote Eve being formed from Adam. Oh, of course. Yeah. And, like, taking the apple first. But in this world, where, like, all of this happened, it's, like, misogyny actually happened because this happened. Like, it's a different direction. Yeah, and why yeah. did this happen? Because Crowley fucking created misogyny, God. <laughs> God, this is on them so hard. I wonder if they ever think about that. Probably not. So, right, now we get the first meeting. Yeah, so the first meeting is, they're talking, they introduce themselves to each other, and Crowley says that he doesn't know why, like, like he doesn't think that giving the apple isn't is that bad. Yeah, and like And that God super Azurafil, overreacted. Yeah. And Azurafil is like, well it must be bad because you did it and you're a demon. And he's like, Well, what else? <laughs> and then we also find out that Azurafil gave his flaming sword to the two <laughs> to Adam and Eve. So as to fucking help them out which I thought yeah. was like it's such a nice um, introduction to his character that like this is there is this um, duty that was thrust upon me which is to have this sword this flaming sword and like he just gave it away because it might help these two I yeah. don't know I thought it was real sweet it's a really good moment cause it's like you think that he's just like a rule stickler or whatever, or yeah. that he doesn't think for himself, but it's like, no, like, he has, like, very strong compassion, and he acts on that, and then afterwards he just has to, like, justify it to himself, or hide it in some way, and, like, Crowley is the one who draws it out of him that, like, hey, all the shit you were saying earlier about good and evil, so, um, how does that stack up with how you actually feel, huh, bud? And, um, yeah. they have this, they have this exchange of, like, well, what if, what I, the angel, did was actually bad, and what you, the demon, did was actually good. Wouldn't it be so funny if we both got it wrong? And then it starts raining, and I suppose this is an important scene because you have talked about it. <laughs> but um, Azurafail, like, lifts his wing so as to cover Crowley's head as it rains. Yeah. It's the first rainstorm of the new world, and it's... Mm -hmm. I'm just so stuck on how, like, Crowley edges closer to Xerophil and, like, leans into him even before he lifts the wing. And I know it's probably just because, like, we don't hear them talking and discussing it beforehand. But, like, I just like the idea that, like, they're already comfortable enough with each other that they're like, hey, like, you'll protect me, right? And, like... It is important to note that this is not in the book or the original 2015 draft of the show. Like, Neil Gaiman added that in later because he wanted to either bait or long con, and I support that. I quite like the kind of um, conflict that they have here. It's not that you're evil and I'm good. It's mm -hmm. that you are a vessel of evil and I'm a yeah. vessel of good. But we fundamentally as beings are neither of those things. It's never about them as beings, you know? It's always like the things that they do as instructed to them by the respective bosses. Yeah, but it's like they, they also do still, at least Azerophil still does fall back into the like prescriptive cause and effect getting them mixed up sort of thing like like Crowley is being sarcastic when he's like oh like you're an angel I don't think you can do the wrong thing but like Xerophil's like oh thank god you're right yeah. <laughs> also something I find completely fascinating is throughout the like obviously this is important to them but there are a lot of times in the episode where it is just a job, you know? Yeah. It's just work. Like, for example, 
when they were talking about the thing that they had lunch for in Paris a while back that mm-hmm. Crowley has to make up for or whatever Aziraphale has to make up for like yeah. they 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 go what was that about I don't know but they had amazing crepes and it's like yeah. oh that's amazing like yeah. they don't even remember what they were doing it literally is just a job they are just like me reading Gomen's fic while in the office <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I make a penny, boss makes a dime, that's why I eat crepes on company time, etc. I think, okay, this is yeah. also where I think we mentioned the casting a bit earlier, and like, okay, I think they're both great. Um, I do have a small bone to pick, which is that white people weren't invented yet. Why are they white? Just take them away. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real though. Most people in this episode are white. They didn't have yeah. white people yet. Okay, first, like, if humans were made in, like, the image of God and Adam and Eve are black, like... But, like, Francis McDormand, who narrates as God, is not. Like, I know that evolution didn't happen in this world because, like, it's only 6,000 years old. But, like, I do like the fact that, like, white people weren't here until later... Because of, like, white being considered default in the country that has, like, a monopoly on international culture a lot of the time and stuff. So, like, I don't know. I wish they weren't white, because I don't think they had white people yet. And I guess another thing about this scene is that I feel like it starts establishing the differences between book and show Aziraphale. In that, like, you know, like, Crowley is like... Oh, like, wouldn't it be funny if we, like, did the thing we weren't supposed to do and Aziraphale's, like, laughing a bit. And then he goes, like, no, it wouldn't be funny at all. And, like, I feel like (laughs) show, I think show Aziraphale's just, he's a bit more nervous and, like, I don't want to say ditzy, but, like, kind of, (laughs) than Book Aziraphale, who seems, like, a lot more assured of himself, even if he is, like, a giant hypocrite lying to himself all the time. And, like, I don't think it's a bad choice. Like, I I have fun seeing Michael Sheen do what he does, but sometimes I do wish that Aziraphale was a little more of a badass. We have the opening credits, which, did you skip those or did you watch them? I watched it. I suppose I didn't understand it the way you did, so go on. Oh, I mean, there's not that much to say. It's just, like, fun art and then, like, details about things that are going to happen during the season. Um, We get the theme mm-hmm. song. What did you think about the theme song? I mean, I, it's, I'm familiar with it because... Um, I, this is, I was going to say spoiler, but it's not a spoiler. You guys <laughs> already heard it. It's the intro to our podcast. Yes. Like, um, our... our Intro music is a variation a, of the yeah. It's the it's the Garage Band redo remake of the theme yeah. song. Um, what did you describe it stuff. as when I first sent it to you from our lovely composer? It sounds it sounds very much like something that would come out of Ace Attorney. <laughs> I thought it was really fun. <laughs> I love Ace Attorney music, and I love this tremendously. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a very fun time, and someone on Tumblr recently pointed out that it's a waltz, which I think is fun. Sadly, Mm -hmm. our beautiful, wonderful composer also pointed out to me when she was, like, making it, she was like, I thought it sounded kind of like the BBC Sherlock theme song, so I looked it up and it is the same composer. So now it is forever tainted for me because of that, but it's still a very fun time. Maybe it's just the British sound. Have you considered that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's still the same guy, though. We can't, yeah. we can't forget that. Very sad. Oh, and then, so we cut to a graveyard where we meet two other demons. Oh, first of all, we cut to a graveyard. It's eleven years ago, so like two thousand and eight. And, or I guess 2007, because later we find out that Bush is still president. We meet two other demons, 
Haster and Ligger. And Haster and Ligger both, like, Haster has, like, I mean, his animal motif is maggots and, you know, he has completely black eyes and his hair is messed up and stuff. And Ligger has a chameleon on his head. I think they both have fun character designs. I mean, they're talking to each other a bit about how Crowley is late for a meeting with both of them and that, like, he's changed his name from Crowley to Crowley and they think that he spent too much time up on Earth, blah, blah, blah. And then... I mean, the way he's introduced in and this then scene, where it's he, like, <laughs> the, we hear a car, and we hear Bo- Bohemian Rhapsody's Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia part blasting, and Crowley just, I love he, it. he swerves into the graveyard. And God, this is such a cute, like, where are they now thing. Like, we just saw him. And, like, now he's here being, like, a flash bastard. <laughs> and such a fun little guy. He comes out. He's swaggering. He is doing the, the David Tennant slut walk, as the girlies like to call it, I think. <laughs> Which I think is I a it. character choice given that, like, Crowley is, like, original form was a snake or whatever um and you know it's much appreciated and you know the demons are all like hail satan hail satan but then crowley who is also a he's like just goes hi guys "Uh, hi guys (laughs) (laughs) and like sorry i'm late like you know how traffic is on the blah 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 and i tried to cut up towards blah and it's like i don't know it's very very fun like immediately establishes like he is literally just a guy living on earth with a few extra powers they have to recount their deeds of the day so both haster and ligger have like deeds that are like like, yeah very very traditional medieval (laughs) yeah Yeah, like, like you, you can fucking see these kinds of deeds in like 1610 Bavaria or whatever. Like it's like <laughs> I've tempted a priest. He saw hot girl and went a wooga. There's a politician, and we made him take a bribe. It's in a year we will have him, and like it's it's the same lie. Like in a year we will have him, mm-hmm. and like as um Crowley is just like. I fucking destroyed the <laughs> the cell towers around <laughs> London, so now no one can call each other. Yeah. God, so good. Um, There's a missing scene, wh- which I think was actually originally filmed, where in... Or maybe it's just in the script, but it was supposed to show how he did that, and how he did that was that he, like, got into, like, one of the, like, phone company whatever buildings and then he commandeered an army of rats to wreck all the equipment <laughs> and they probably didn't have the cgi budget for it but i i i feel cheated and robbed that i didn't get to see that and he was able to do it because he may or may not be from the year of the rat this is so true so true he was ex- like i love that when he said this, he was like kind of expecting applause or like oh, amazement, yeah. and the guys were just like, "Okay." <laughs> and right, he was like, like yeah, "What's yeah, that he... supposed to do?" Yeah, yeah, and he was like, "Oh, it's gonna sow the seeds of chaos, and in many, many years, we'll have many, many more souls." And like, what he likes about it is that like, he like everything, like everyone being like angry at each other and doing bad things as a result is like something that they'll think up themselves rather than like something that he had to like really strong arm them into so it's like yeah yeah it's Mm -hmm. about preserving free will sort of but also creating an environment where it is difficult to be a good person Mm -hmm. and i mean yeah he is bragging a lot he's like Hey, like, no one in hell is complaining about my methods. They love me down there. Yeah. What a fun <laughs> fucking guy. Also, I just, I like that, okay, like, in the 
book, like, he's described as a young man, and in the upcoming graphic novel, he's supposed to look 24. But, like, they cast David Tennant, who's, like, 50, in this role, so now he has, like, like that, like, aging rock star loser dad who's going through a midlife Uh, crisis kind of vibe instead, which is very fun paired with his attempting to be cool vibes. Yeah. I also like the idea that now that we are in a more modern age with more modern technology, Eva manifests in more modern ways as well. Yeah. And like, I don't know, I I really love that concept. Right. Like, before you really did have to go up to priests and whisper in their ear, but like, (laughs) you know what? We're good now. Just post a really bad take on Tumblr and, like, three people will yell out their partners today. Anyway, um, he gets given a little baby in a basket. We don't know it's a baby yet, but he does get given a menacing basket. He is not happy. (laughs) And I love how, like, in the beginning of the scene, he's like, oh, you guys just don't get it. They love me down there. And then, like, when it it becomes obvious that he is to start Armageddon and he is not too amused by the idea, and he's like, why me? And they were like, well, they love you down there. And then it's revealed later that he's been fucking lying to hell. <laughs> yeah, that's why they love him so much. <laughs> like, yeah. They think he started the Spanish Inquisition in World War II. <laughs> yeah. Literally, it's just a job, and he's just fucking lying to his boss. In the book, he doesn't even lie. Like, he gets sent, like, a medal that's like, thank you for starting the Spanish Inquisition, because they just assumed he did it. And he was like, what the fuck is that? (laughs) And he went over and he saw it, and then he, like, had to get drunk in a gutter for two weeks because it made him so upset. No! Yeah. Oh, he's my favorite little girl. Love him. He goes, guys, it's not really my scene. (laughs) When he's given the basket... And Haster yeah. goes, it's your scene, your starring role. Which I think is a fun thing to think about when... I don't know, I just, I like that phrase. Because I like how both he and Aziraphale's lives are so much play acting. Which I also think is very queer, but I guess we'll get into that later. Is this the one where he tries to call Crowley and it's... Uh, when he tries to call Aziraphale and there's no lines. <laughs> <'cause> he <laughs> already destroyed the yeah, cell phone lines or is that later? Oh, that's later. <laughs> yeah, but um, that's real funny. Like, the callback to that I thought was fucking hilarious. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, also, something that I'm so sad that they took out um, is they ask him to sign a contract. Um. Oh, they do, yeah. Right, and then, like... He, like, just signs it with, like, a sigil using, like, hellfire from his tongue or whatever. But in in the book, at first he takes out, like, a nice, like, fancy waterproof pen. And he signs, like, the name that he goes by, like, Anthony J. Crowley. And they go, like, no, don't do that. Put down your real name. And then he has to, like, change it to, like, the demonic sigil or whatever. Like... They took out that trans moment, and I wanted that trans moment. Give me the trans moment back. For real. And then we meet John Ham, who is so important oh, wait, to uh, me. Oh, should we? Well, first Satan calls him in the car. Yeah, but who give a shit? We meet John Ham after. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, Satan it... calls him in the car. Yeah, so, oh, well, which establishes that hell communicates with him through, like, his radio and other things. And in the car, it's also when it gets revealed that what is in the basket is a baby. The whole time, when he's in the car, he's, like, yelling, like, shit, 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 why me? Which I think is, like, because I'm so used to Supernatural, I was like, oh my god, they can swear on this show? (laughs) So, it was, it's very fun that he didn't have to say friggin'. Um... And we also get a god narration moment where she says, like, Crowley was all in favor of Armageddon in general terms, but it was one thing to work to bring it about and quite another for it to actually happen. Which I think is, like, an interesting insight into his psyche where it's, like, 
we do see him questioning things a lot in the opening scene, but also, like, a lot of the times he is just vibing and trying not to think too much about his job. And, like, the thing that bothers him more than, like, the Earth ending, I feel like, is, like, him being directly responsible for it. Like, as you've said earlier, he's not a killer. Like, he doesn't do it directly. He's more of a, you know... I'm going to be a silly, goofy guy, and then if there's stuff that happens because of it, then so it be, so it is. Yeah. So, like, I guess this is kind of out of his league, where he has Mm -hmm. to directly do things for a concrete goal. Yeah. Oh, fun, fun fact about Book Crowley is that one of his, like, demonic deeds that he does is, um, he just takes coins and he glues them to the sidewalk so people (laughs) bend down to pick them up and then they can't get them off and, like, he's like, that's, that's my doing evil for the day. I did it. Love that. He has the concept of evil of, like, a nine-year-old (laughs) boy. Exactly. Okay. We meet John Hamm. You can finally say this. (laughs) We meet John Hamm, and he's Gabriel. He's the angel Gabriel. Wait, what do you know John Hamm from? Like, I have no clue who this guy is. I just know him fundamentally as a person. You know? You would know him by... What's like the a- song of Achilles like? <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. He is my Achilles. Yeah, I just Wait, know like, him. What was he even Who in? doesn't know John Hamm? Me! What was he even in I besides sh- Good Omens? I, I, th- I think he was in... Well, I knew him before this, but he's definitely in an episode of Black Mirror, I think. Oh, okay, I haven't seen that. And then, I think John Hamm is just one of those guys who, like... Like, do you know um, Brad Pitt from anywhere? Like, even if you have watched a movie or anything with Brad Pitt in it, you just know who Brad Pitt is, you know? That's true, I've never seen anything with Brad Pitt in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, people do act like he's famous. Yeah, and you know what? Fun fact. Crystal knows this, but when um, I was first being exposed to good omens through Crystal Means, I looked up um, (laughs) Aziraphale and Crowley on YouTube, and what showed up is an interview with between David Tennant and (laughs) John Hamm. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I thought John Hamm was Aziraphale. And How long that. did you think that John Hamm was a zero fan? I mean, for a second, like I was like, "Whoa, is John Hamm a zero fan?" And then I continued scrolling. Yeah, he's not. He is not. Thank God. Yeah, I'm so glad Michael Sheen's in this. I haven't seen him in anything else, but like, thank God. This scene is very. Is very again telling of how a zero fan is different from other angels, which. I think we are supposed to presume that angels are more like Gabriel than Aziraphale. But mm. um, they're in a sushi place and Azir- uh, Aziraphale is talking about how the sushi is good and he really likes it. You dip it in soy sauce and all yeah, that. Yeah, and at this I saved the Tumblr URL soy sauce Aziraphale to go with my supernatural blog URL. I don't think I'm going to use it, but it's nice to have. It's nice to have, exactly. Anyway, Gabriel doesn't like this. He thinks it's nasty to soil your temple, or however he puts it. Uh, yeah, sully the temple of my yeah. celestial, of my celestial body. Matter. Yeah. Yeah. And he relays that the end is near, and things are afoot. You know, I've only heard the word afoot used in Sherlock Holmes context. Yeah, I am same. beginning to think that maybe British people just say it. Maybe. Though, I mean, Gabriel's American. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Uh, it's You know, very when you put funny. them together in a room, I cannot recognize the difference between an American and a British accent. It also is revealed here that heaven, and I presume hell also, thinks that Crow- Crowley and Aziraphale have never met Don't or talked to each other. Don't know each other? Yeah, exactly. Which is very fascinating Yeah. to hear. Because, like, I think this this knowledge barrier sets a kind of 
fallibility in with the angels and the demons where it's like they don't know everything because mm-hmm. they don't even know this and that makes the later happenings with adam and um warlock a lot more believable because you know yeah. like how did they just not know that the kids were exchanged and like it's because they're not um all knowing yeah and yeah. like they don't see everything this is a good like handicap in a way for the angels and the demons where because i feel like in you know a lot of media it's like oh they have all the power uh, but mm-hmm. like here they are very explicit like this is the limits of their power they don't know everything yeah i really like just the way that the angels and demons operate in these opening scenes like in the book um gabriel doesn't exist and heaven never interacts directly with Aziraphale, so it does feel more like a panopticon they're probably just always watching so you better watch out sort of thing but like here it really is just like no they aren't always watching but also they can pop up whenever so like you always do have to be afraid you always have to have an excuse or like somewhere to hide but like you can also do your own thing and it is exactly like living in a house with your parents while you're closeted in gay, I think. No, we're fucking it, Yeah, like, when you don't have a lock on your door and it's like, okay, like, I can, like, be on Tumblr, like, looking at girls kissing or whatever, like, when I want. But also, I always need to have a homework tab open on, like, another window and know the, like laptop keyboard shortcut to get there and blah 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 blah. (laughs) i don't know i like it i like it a lot it's very queer to me and i also like that like with like the demons it was like a preset meeting they couldn't do anything about crowley being late if he just didn't show up at all like they'd probably track him down but like it's still like at least they give you warning heaven like just popping in whenever feels very much like the NSA's whole, like, well, if you have nothing to hide, then, like, what's wrong with us, like, looking at you whenever we want thing? We go to the plot, and the plot is there's two women giving birth, and one of them is, like, a normal, like, British couple, and the yeah. other is a fucking ambassador. Yeah, played by Nick Offerman. Like, American ambassador, yeah, or whatever. American diplomats. Oh my god, I love this scene so much! We we enter, like, a convent, and there's yeah. a bunch of nuns. Yeah, and it's a satanic convent. Yeah! They, and they, they call themselves the Chattering Order, and later... Mm-hmm. And I was like, the Chattering Order, that's a funny thing to say. And then later, when they're arguing with a demon, they're like, talking and talking and talking and the demon's like oh, stop talking you're so annoying and they're like we're the chattering order all we do is talk <laughs> and i yeah. love that so much it is i think fun. this is such a fun concept that they have evil evil yeah. ones i do i think yeah. in the book they like make up a saint who like prayed to like not have to marry a pagan so then like god or someone satan or someone gave her powers so that she could never stop talking and it, like, annoyed her, like, husband so much that they never had to consummate the marriage or something. Which feels, yes. from from two men, sort of feels like a women, am I right, kind of joke. But, like, <laughs> yeah. it is still fun to see in motion. We figure out that this is where the baby swap, the baby swap is gonna happen. And it's, you know, it's a whole thing. They're, they're planning it out. A a couple of things go wrong, stuff gets mixed up, and suddenly, oh, well, the the satanic baby is supposed to go to the rich couple. Right. But it ends up on the hands of the other couple. But nobody knows that this went wrong. Everybody just assumed that everybody did the right thing. And nobody double checks with anyone. Specifically, yeah, where the the wrong really happens... Well, first, like, Crowley meets Mr. Young, who's, like, the, the normal British guy outside. And, like, he directs Crowley to room three for the baby. Yeah. So, like, that's where the baby gets taken. 
And then, like, a nun who knows that, like, the baby is with the wrong person comes in, asks the other nun, like, non-verbally, okay, like, where's the real baby so I can take, like, the real Antichrist to the American couple. The but, other room, yeah. Yeah, but that nun misunderstands and thinks that the extraneous baby is the one that is to be pointed out. And, um, fun book fact is that, um, in the book, Mr. Young is homophobic and, like, he's nervous about being in the nunnery because he's like, I recently watched a movie where the nuns were lesbians and I'm worried that, like, the nuns here are icky lesbians also. And then when he sees, like, the nonverbal communication that ends in a wink, he goes, oh god, they are lesbians. <laughs> And I feel like this is just, like, you know how I complained for, like, like, weeks and weeks on Peach about how, like, the book is just obsessed with making gay jokes while also, like, not letting a single character actually be gay? So, yeah, there's an example of that. I don't even know what they were going with. Was it just, like, a, we want to, like, satirize, like people, like, having, like, a pink scare or whatever moment by being, like, everyone thinks everyone is gay for, like, certain behaviors, but, like, it's not. But, like, the if you do it in a way that's, like, you're being silly because there's, like, no gay people anywhere anyway. Like, <laughs> shut up. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> shut the fuck up. Anyway, so, yeah, that's that scene. And, I don't know, there's some fun moments where, like, the god narrator is, like, trying to explain how the swap happened through, like, playing cards. And then at some point, one of the nuns runs into room two, and it turns out that the visual of the cards being shuffled that we saw was actually just, like, two nuns chilling and playing cards by themselves in that room. Like, I don't know, just some fun, like, visual gags. And it ends with, like, the nuns, like, wheeling out the third baby, the Dowling biological baby, yeah. baby, and while well, menacing music plays, and there's like a narration about how like, oh, if you want, you can believe that he got adopted by a perfectly nice family, and he probably wins awards for his tropical fish, but you know, but in the book, actually, that does happen, and this third baby grows up to be named Greasy Johnson, and he is one of Adam's, like, rivals in the village. Like, he has a rival gang to the them. But this does not manifest in the show. Which is sad, because that was fun. Uh, oh, also, the nuns, like, are trying to suggest names to both of the parents, because they're like, we want a good (laughs) antichrist name. And both of them are like, hey, how about Damien? (laughs) And, god, okay, Harriet Dowling... I know this happened because, okay, like, the thing with Harriet Dowling and the American ambassador is that he's not there for the birth because he's with the president. He's with President Bush right now, and he's just watching everything on video camera and being, like, a neglectful husband or whatever. So, like, she gets the baby, and she's like, well, we were gonna, like, name it, like, name him Thaddeus after, like, my husband and also, like, his dad and his dad before that, but, like... Oh, you want me to name him Morlock? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. <laughs> like, it, I feel like this, like, it's like, who the fuck would willingly name their kid Warlock? But I think it's because she's mad at her husband. And you know what? Slay, like, that kid got the coolest name out of anyone. That kid grew up and everybody he interacted with thought he was transgender. <laughs> <laughs> God, for fucking real. Good for yeah. him. Yeah, and um, meanwhile, Mr. Young gets convinced to name the Antichrist Adam. Adam, which is a cool, cool name. I like yeah. the name Adam. Is Damien supposed to be like, because it sounds like demon? Yeah, I think that is maybe the origin of the name. Let me look up Damien name origin. Okay, yeah, it sounds like demon, but apparently it means to subdue. That makes sense for like a future like ruler of a broken world or whatever yeah anyway um crowley and aziraphale meet they they meet in saint james park and there's this well first we see aziraphale in his bookshop which is important to me like okay 
I suppose yeah. this is important because you mentioned it a lot in your synopsis of season two that I may or may not have listened to fully. I mean, we'll see the um, bookshop later. But yeah, they kiss like, here. Yeah. yeah, they sure do. <laughs> quote unquote. <laughs> they quote. One of them kisses the other one, and whether the other one is also kissing the other one is up for debate. I've I've been swayed. To the, the they are both kissing each other side a little bit more recently. But anyway. So, yeah, we see a moment of Azir Hill in his bookshop. And I don't he's just being so cute. He has, like, a vinyl of, like, classical music on. And he's sort of, like, moving slash singing to the beat as he, like, puts his jacket up on a hook. And we get a good look at his waistcoat, which is, like, tatty and old that, like, he wears everywhere all the time, which is, like, so autism of him. Love that for him. I like that they, a lot more than Crowley, they make Aziraphil, um very into, like, pleasure. You know, he likes yeah. food. He likes, um, like, very nice champagne. You know, all that stuff. Because... I suppose, like, the stereotypical thing to do is to give those traits to the demon. Like, right. the hedonistic traits yes. to the demon. But, like, he has this, like, appreciation for these things. Um, like, I, I like that. I think that's yeah. a very cool trait to have to give an angel. I agree. I wonder if it's just, like, if, like inspiring lust and sloth and stuff is already part of your job maybe it's not like fun anymore <laughs> by yourself i mean i think crowley has his own ways of indulging like his his silly vintage car and his clothes <sighs> that he you. updates like every year or whatever but yeah he doesn't yeah. really indulge in the pleasures of the flesh a lot it's more just like a how do I look cool and seem cool? That's when Crowley finally is able to call Zirphil. He's unable to do it, like, over the phone line, so he ends up in a phone booth, which I love. And they have a brief conversation where, well, Gabriel specifically told Zirphil, like, Crowley's the one who's starting Armageddon, by the way. And they have a conversation where Zara feels like, yeah, we do have to talk. Well, okay, first he starts by saying, like, we're closed. Which is, I mean, a fun of trait is that he owns a bookshop, but he hates selling his books because he likes all of them, so he does everything he can to dissuade customers from buying any. <laughs> so this is the, <laughs> the beginning of that. Living. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, they have a conversation where it's just like, we should talk. Yeah, this is about Armageddon. Yeah, I agree, we should talk. And I like that, like, Crowley, like, does the job first. Because, like, he has to, or else he'll get, like, tortured or whatever the fuck, right? So he's, he doesn't try to not give the baby away. It's just like, okay, I've, like, complied with my part, and now let me, like do my own thing to make it not work. And I also like that, like, Aziraphale's never, never, like, called Crowley and tried to stop him from setting the first piece into motion. Like, both of them are aware of, like, okay, there are, like, limits to what we can do independently, but here we are, let's talk. They're in the St. James Park, and, like, the narrator does this, like, pretty funny bit where it's, like, yeah, like, everybody who meets here is meeting in sick secret in some way, and the mm -hmm. dogs have, like, they have a Pavlovian response to, like, FBI agents now. Yeah. <laughs> Where, like, when, when one comes, they just to fucking start quacking for bread. I love that. Also, we, we get a good look at Crowley's full outfit, and did you notice that his belt is a snake Ouroborosing? No, but that's pretty cool. Yeah, I can send you the picture given that you obviously care so much about everything. <laughs> also, we learn here that they this is like their usual meet meeting place. They've done this a lot. Yeah. And that this is like the first mention of th um, the apocalypse being like 11 years in the making. Mm. 
Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I love, would love the costumes like that. in this show. It's so fun. Yeah, I love Crowley's layers. Like, he looks so fucking transgender right now. He has, like, a gray shirt on and then, like, a black waistcoat on and then, like, a black blazer on over that. I don't know, that's, like, pretty much identical to, like, the outfit that I wanted to do for prom one year. Okay, why does Crowley not want the apocalypse to happen? Well, I mean, what we get from the god narration earlier is just that he doesn't want to do it directly, but I think, like, he seems to have, like, a love for humanity. Like, he's clearly, like, yeah. gone native or whatever, right? Like, yeah, the he way they talks say it, like yeah. he's, like... He talks like someone who complains about the traffic with other people, you know? And, like, yeah. we don't actually meet any human friends of his here or really in the book. But, like, I feel like he does have, like... I think it really is less about, like, liking humanity for other humans. It's, like, he likes to be this way. Like, mm. he likes being here on Earth. He likes, you know... Yeah. And if the apocalypse is to happen, then all of these things are just gone. And I think it's fascinating because even though this is not explicitly said about him, the way he approaches Azura Fail, mm. it's the same concept. Like, he thinks it's gonna work on Azura Fail because it probably is his thought process as well. To Azura Fail, it's like, oh, like they don't have liquor in heaven. The, you know, and then he also mentions, like, eternity. Yeah. Which I thought was fascinating. They both don't like the idea of everything being endless. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like his approach with Aziraphale is, like, Aziraphale tailored rather than, like, necessarily something that he thinks himself that he's just trying on Aziraphale. Like, he is just listing, like, things that Aziraphale likes. But, like... Yeah, I do mm -hmm. think, like, just liking being on Earth is a primary thing. Also, can we talk a bit about how they're sitting on the bench? Like, the thing's like... Okay. <laughs> they're, okay, they're sitting on the farthest possible edges of the bench from each other in that, like, if you look at, like, where their butts are, like, they're on opposite ends. But because of Crowley's, like, posture, he's, like, leaning, yeah. like all the way taking up half the bench yeah yeah taking up half the bench and leaning all the way towards Aziraphale so that his elbow is just like on the brink of brushing Aziraphale's shoulder as he talks to him and I don't know it's a fun visual representation of like we like have to stay rooted to our sides but like I am going to like make my way over to you in the ways that I can oh that's nice yeah yeah they make me crazy. Yeah. And the fact that Aziraphale is just sitting there with his hands in his lap, like, I can't do anything. They go to the fucking bookshop, and well, this is where that conversation they, they about, like, the, the crepes happen. For, well, they're, they're walking to the car and have that conversation, and then they go to the Ritz, and then they go to the bookshop to get drunk. But, yeah, yeah, I think a fun, like, they have a conversation and, you know, Crowley's, like, doing, like, the tempting thing to, like, try to get Aziraphale to help him out. Um, well, okay, first we get, like, Aziraphale bitchy moment where he's, like, seriously, like, you're giving him to an American diplomat? Like, that's so, like, Hollywood <laughs> blockbuster. <Yeah. laughs> Which, I, yeah, I don't know. I just love when people complain about trivial things instead of facing things head on because they're bitches because like same bro and he also starts by being like oh like it's gonna be fine though because like heaven's gonna win obviously and it's all gonna be great and like i don't think he believes any of that but it is just interesting how he feels the need to like play this role like I don't know if he's, like... This advocate, yeah. In denial, or if he's just, like, well, this is the company line and I'm used to just saying it. But, yeah, I don't know. It's just the way that they talk to each other. Like, Aziraphale never, ever says what he means. And Crowley never says directly what he means. 
But, like, because both of them are aware of how much their hands are tied, like, they still understand each other most of the time, which I think is very nice. Like, and they're both just playing their roles so well. Like, Crowley is, like, just doing the, like, snake-tempting Eve thing to Xerophale. Because, like, that's just what they're used to, and that works. Eventually. So, yeah. Uh, also, as they head out of the park, there is a traffic warden trying to write a ticket for the Bentley because of how it's parked. And then as the two of them drive away, the um, ticket book in his hands explodes. And in the book, it is, specific- it is specified that Aziraphale was the one who did that. In the show, they do not say who did it, which makes me sad. You know, Aziraphale just keeps saying no, and Crowley eventually is like, okay, let's just have lunch as, like, a social thing, then. I probably yeah. I won't mention <laughs> this again. It's purely social. <laughs> yeah. And then, well, you know, they they go to drink. At and this Ritz. is where the sound of music... Um, oh, well, I mean, will they still go to the Ritz? For it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I, I just think the that the... And they just go, you know what I want to do? I want to get drunk. Like, that's all that yeah. happens in the No, Ritz. but it's like the way that they're sitting. <laughs> Like, what? it's- Crowley isn't eating, like, he doesn't even have a plate in front of him, yeah, yeah. he has a cup of coffee, and what he's doing is he's sitting and he's leaning forward, like, with his fucking, like, fist in his mouth, just watching Aziraphale eat and make, like, mmm sounds. Like, it's crazy horny, in my opinion. <laughs> But, I mean, clearly that you did not get any particular impression from it. I, I don't, does does the screenshot not, not arouse any particular feelings in you? Absolutely not. This is how I eat with all of my friends. (laughs) Okay, well, I, I think that they want to fuck so bad it's unreal. Okay, but yeah, you're right. Finally, they're okay. They're in the bookshop and they're getting drunk. Fine, we can finally get to that scene. I mean, I don't really have much to say about this. It's just they're drunk and they're talking in a drunken way about how, like, oh, like, you know, the gorillas are I, gonna I, I, die and they're all so innocent. This is where I don't know if I mentioned it in this recording or I mentioned it to you off of the recording but like mm-hmm. I thought this sound of music bit was so fucking funny yeah um, basically like um, Crowley just says oh like maybe in heaven like you'll climb every mountain well, over and over again cause like yeah, you're gonna yeah. be there for eternity yeah and like he goes like you know what I heard God really likes sound of music and um, Aziraphale looks mortified by this. Right. And he goes like, there's not going to be any Stephen Sondheim in heaven. He holds up into the woods, which I haven't listened to. But it's always fun to yeah. get a taste of Aziraphale's music taste. I don't know if this is... I don't know if this is... If it happens here or in the bench. But he also talks about how, like, none of the good composers are in heaven. <laughs> Yeah, that's on the like bench. Like, the box are in hell, Mozart's in hell, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And, like, Aziraphale goes, yeah, but they already made their music, <laughs> so we can just use the music <laughs> in heaven, which I thought was funny as hell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but... The sound of music yeah. thing, I think, is so interesting, because, okay, I can totally buy God liking sound of music, but I don't get, like, but the why other would, like, angels... But why would not like it? Well... Okay, yeah. First, that's... I, I do feel offended that Aziraphale doesn't like the sound of yeah. music, because that musical was my entire childhood. Like, the movie with Julie Andrews taught me what love was, and I still exactly. think that that dancing scene is, like, what invented sexual tension in, like, our modern age. But, yeah, okay, first off, What's wrong with the sound of music? I think that the music in it is like I know exactly. Good. Like, what's wrong with it? It's fine. It's a good fucking time. They even yodel. And yeah, secondly, why would heaven like the sound of music? It's literally about like 
a woman running away from the nunnery to fuck a dilf. <laughs> I don't get it. I get why God would, because, like, God is, like, a funny little girl. But, like, I don't get it. Okay, for example, like, the only thing that has made me, like, similarly confused is in, like, oranges are not the only fruit when it's revealed. Well, like, it's, like, oh, like, one of the books that, like, Jeanette's mom reads to her all the time is Jane Eyre. And I'm like, why would she do that? It's, like, about, like, bigamy and, yeah. like, all that shit. And then it's revealed later in the book that she, that Jeanette has been receiving, like, every time her mom has read it to her, her mom has edited the ending so that Jane actually marries Sinjin and joins him to colonize India via being a missionary. And, like, that's why she, like, received it so much because like she didn't receive the real version but like yeah i don't like i don't think sound of music is being edited up there so like why is this the heaven musical yeah maybe there's a ghost facers effect in heaven and they censor the ending as well yeah yeah she never gets to fuck that dilf not once so sad it is so sad there's this scene where they're like, oh, we're too drunk for this. Let's sober up. It's yeah. so disgusting. Yeah, they fucking shit it's out so the disgusting. wine, basically. Like, they both make constipated faces, and it fills back up. Yeah, the wine bottle fills back up. It may be right. the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. Okay, I think a little bit earlier, before they enter the bookshop, there is a scene that I want to mention where... um. Crowley's still trying to convince Aziraphale, and... Is it the one with the, um... Get, get the, behind yeah. me, you fiend? <laughs> yeah, so... That's my best line. I wrote it as my best line. Really? I was gonna... Okay. Yeah, I loved it. It, the thing... Okay, so what happens is, like, Aziraphale's, like, Crowley, like, I'm not helping you, I'm not interested, this is purely social. I am an angel. You are a demon. We're hereditary enemies. Get thee behind me, foul fiend. And then he goes after you. (laughs) And, okay, the thing about that line, it annoys me because it's clearly, like, a line for the trailer. You know what I mean? Like, some lines in some Uh, things are clearly just for the trailer. Like, they don't make that much sense in canon. Like, it's just a soundbite for the trailer. And it is in the trailer. I know, it's funny. It is funny, isolated which is why it's such a good line for the trailer but okay so it did annoy me a bit however i also do like if i just take it as part of canon and say that okay sure he would say that it's like i feel like it is the perfect encapsulation of like how much they are just play acting their roles right now yeah like Mm-hmm. He's just saying that to be camp. <laughs> like <laughs> it means nothing. I I love I love the ways that they communicate through layers and then peel back the layers. Good for them. Yeah. Also, right. Also, Crowley takes his sunglasses off while they're getting drunk, but only after they're partly drunk, which is quite different from in season 2. He just takes his sunglasses off whenever he's alone with Aziraphale, like, and not in public. I don't know. I think it's nice that, like, currently he's at a point where, like, he doesn't fully feel comfortable showing Aziraphale his eyes all the time, but, like, eventually he does grow to do that. Oh, also, everyone, the, the drunk scene in the bookshop is, like, my favorite scene in the book, and they cut out a bunch of it. And, um, you should, we will reblog the audio of David Tennant doing a live reading of that section of the book. It's ten minutes long, but it's worth it, and I listen to it daily, so go check that out on <laughs> bustyationbeautiespod.tumblr.com. Anyway, I don't know. They they also do this, they do a scene after where the nonary burns down, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And, like, really, the whole point of that is to just erase all possible ways that they could know that the babies were switched incorrectly. Mm-hmm. Yep. Aziraphale and Crowley talk more solemnly now, more soberly, yep. about what they might do to thwart the thwart, yeah. evil wiles of the Hellbell. And this is 
Another line that I loved so oh, immensely. Yeah. Like, you see talking. a while, you thwart. <laughs> it's so fun. Literally, you see a while, He's you thwart. such a silly little guy. But yeah, basically, Crowley's able to reframe, like, Aziraphale helping him stop the apocalypse as Aziraphale going against hell, which is part of his job description. So therefore, like, it's mm-hmm. fine. Like, you wouldn't be going against orders if you did this. And the way the, the way they do it, right? Mm. He is very adamant that, like, even when he goes to heaven to report what's happening, heaven doesn't necessarily reprimand him or tell him to stop doing it. Yeah. Because Crowley's right, like, this is, in a way, part of the job description. Mm-hmm. But Heaven is still very vocal that, like, yeah, it's not gonna work. Yeah, it's nice that you're doing this, but... Eh. But it's not happening. Yeah. Also, the... Okay, specifically, their plan is that both Aziraphale and Crowley will be involved in, like, the upbringing of the Antichrist, who they think is Warlock. Um, And, like, Crowley thinks that it's, like, fully, like, nurture and not nature. Like, apparently part of his job from hell was to, like, provide evil influence over the baby and, like, get him ready to take over the world. So Aziraphale's just supposed to be there to, like, teach him to be nice (laughs) as well. Yeah. Yeah, which is very cute. I, and, yeah, again, I like that, like, this is all a plan that, like, doesn't require them to go, either of them to go outside of their job descriptions. Like, it's not like both of them are there telling the kid to be nice because if Hell found out about that, Crowley would be, like, tortured and whatever. Like, it's like, yeah, it's very, it's very malicious compliance. They're quite quitting. (laughs) (laughs) God, what a stupid fucking... Anyway, Azuraphale comes in as a gardener. Yeah. And he looks like shit. Crowley comes in. Yeah, Crowley comes in as a nun. And he may well, as or a may nanny. not look like the hottest person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nanny. I just said nun. Um, comes in as a nanny. Hottest person I've ever seen. Quite possibly ever. And um, they just do this thing where... Every time Warlock goes to the garden, Aziraphale is like, Oh, you should take care of all the creatures, and you should never kill or hurt them, and should never destroy Earth as we know it. And, like, he comes in, and Crowley's there, and he's like, Um, the gardener told me that I shouldn't hurt creatures. And Aziraphale is like, I don't know, and Crowley's like, Well, you should. (laughs) And there's, like, a lullaby scene where he sings a lullaby to the kid. Yeah. Also, David Tennant gets to use his Scottish accent as the nanny. Thank God. It's criminal that they're making him be British, and they're making Michael Sheen, a Welsh actor, be British also in this show. Sad. Sad. I've seen some people um, see, like, Crowley as the nanny as, like, transphobic, and I think the reasoning there is, um, first that, like, Brother Francis is supposed to be, like, comical, like, Aziraphale is supposed to look like shit and his voice is supposed to be stupid or whatever, right? So, like, it seems that, like, that paired with Crowley showing up as a nanny and, like, being played by, like, David Tennant, but, like, dressing in woman's clothes and presenting as a woman in this specific scene, like... It's like, is it supposed to be tonally similar where we're like, oh, that's funny? And, I mean, I did not think that or feel that, but, like, I think some people could, and it is hard to tell what exactly was intended or what exactly gets portrayed just because that's, like, not something I felt, but, like, I feel like some people could be like, oh, like, him in that dress is funny. And then I think another thing is that, um, like, maybe less so in the book, or sorry, less so in the show, but in the book, there's, like, a pretty long passage about how, like, the, this, like, nanny shows up, and, like, she has, like, dominatrix vibes, and, like, Everyone who sees her is kind of like, huh, I mean, what has she got going on there? 
which feels like it is playing into like like trans misogynistic tropes of like trans women being like over sexualized and like only being seen as like sex workers or like things like that so like i can definitely see that perspective and i feel like there probably was a way to change the presentation of the scene so that it is less playing into things like that but yeah i don't know another thing is like okay i feel like there's been the argument that like crowley is like non-binary and that like there are like later scenes where like they're like presenting like as a woman in a way that's like not for the sake of a job or something so like sometimes it's just like something that he likes to do or whatever but i think that because we see that in this time period like when she's like reporting to hell or whatever like they're like in like they're like more like masculine presenting form so like in this case like it isn't like just like a honest representation of like their gender identity at this time at least is like the vibe that i'm getting so i feel like that reason for why it can't be transphobic doesn't really hold up here with media this recent i tend to have the perspective of giving it the benefit of the doubt because you know like um, most of the time the older the media is the more probable (laughs) the um, concept of it being explicitly transphobic from the writer's perspective is but like you know the more recent it is i am to believe that the writer is more aware of like issues like this blah blah but like i get where yeah also this is this is from trans in the sense that i've seen on tumblr neil gaiman (laughs) yeah i know (laughs) yeah in that yeah i just i don't think he's he knows that much about trans people or understands things very well so i feel like it is easier for him to be sloppy yeah it's shocking to me how much people don't know (laughs) about like stuff like these no Uh, so yeah Yeah. anyway they're trying to get the kid to grow up good on Arzirafil's side completely evil yeah to cancel out and be completely neutral yeah they're pemdassing this kid yeah i mean that could that i mean when they leave warlock at the end like that kid's gonna grow up fucked up. Like, things don't cancel out like that. <laughs> like, he's been growing up with, like, lullabies about how he's gonna take over the world and kill everyone. And then he's being told to not kill everyone. Like, that doesn't... That doesn't equate to, like, yeah. guess I shouldn't think about killing in any direction. <laughs> Good luck to this kid who everyone's gonna think is trans and has the best name and also the worst upbringing. And also, I find it fascinating that this kid that they tried to neutralize as much as possible, we see him in his 11th birthday party, and he seems kind of dickish. Yeah, he's kind of a dick. And then we see the, the actual spawn of Satan, who grew up without all these influences in a... What we can presume is a normal British household, and he seems to be a nice kid. Yeah, you know, we nice don't see much man. of him, but he has friends. He has friends. Um, his friends seem to like him. You know, all that crap. Yeah. So I think maybe if you try to look into it, there is the perspective of um, Adam seemed to have both his parents around, and then like they seem to be nice people, and and then like you have Warlock who grew up in a household where his dad sucked and was never around yeah yeah they're very rich people and like his parents his dad specifically may or may not have been present and Mm -hmm. all that crap and it's like maybe there's something to gain from that perspective like maybe maybe all these things that crowley and azurafil did really doesn't matter i mean it doesn't (laughs) and (laughs) Yeah. yeah exactly like the like it's not a question of like nature versus nurture it's more of what is the nurture that is happening and like 
maybe Azura Fela and Crowley severely underestimated the other factors in the nurture category, you know? Yeah. I mean, how often does the kid t- does, does any child talk to the gardener? <laughs> like, <Yeah>. truly. <laughs> what an odd role. He had one conversation with a gardener who told him to not kill a slug, <laughs> and for some reason this is gonna change his the entire trajectory of his life forever. For real. Anyway, they go to heaven, and then um, Crowley goes to hell. It's a whole thing. Yeah, the set design is very fun. Yeah, oh yeah, I said you wouldn't Yeah, you wanted to talk about that. Hell is presented as kind of like an underground, like, CD club kind of situation. Though, I mean, there's no fun music. It's like a club where the DJ didn't show up. I don't know, they're just there, they're talking. Yeah. It's... It's dimly lit. Versus heaven, which is like... Corporate. A very, very, very lit up corporate establishment. Yeah. I love that there's like windows, but there's nothing out of them except for like blinding white light. Yeah. Like the illusion (laughs) of freedom or like there being a world outside, but like there isn't. I think it's fascinating that they present it this way. And it's it's like... Because... Well, I mean... In Supernatural, they do kind of present it this way, you know? Mm. In other media, I would presume that, like, heaven is kind of like a Garden of Eden kind of situation. Right. Where it's, like, nature and beauty and natural beauty, whatever. And, like, hell is hellfire. Mm-hmm. Um, how is it presented in the books? They... I don't think they It's go... like this? I don't think they ever go to heaven. Book. Oh, except you for know when, what? except you know for what later, think... except for a bit later. What? Neil Gaiman may or may not have watched Supernatural. No, that... actually, cool. actually, um, he hasn't. This is something he's answered on his Tumblr. A lot of people have been like, "Oh, I've seen a lot of like similarities." Ha ha. Are you a Supernatural fan? And each time he's gone, no. But Eric Kripke is a Good Omens fan. He's never <laughs> seen Supernatural, but Eric Kripke is a Good Omens fan. <laughs> So the implication is that the similarities are yeah. supernatural, taken from Good well, Omens. Well, yeah, Good Omens was published God, in 1990. That's as hell. I it's know, but like, book. that's why I'm asking. Like, did the book present heaven and hell this way? Because I if not, think... like, maybe it was a supernatural inspired thing. It's possible that the set designers are we're supernatural fans um yeah that is possible because wasn't there like an I mean, angel sigil in angel season sigil, two right? that was okay but that was just because it was the enochian alphabet that's like in general created by somebody else yeah but i mean i think maybe they just looked up angel sigil yeah. and saw a supernatural angel sigil perhaps with that i feel like the idea of heaven being corporate is a pretty logical conclusion to draw the way it's presented with all its rules and regulations and stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe the set designer was a supernatural fan, but I, d- I don't think so. Well, I do think so. <laughs> the the hell scene, we get to meet Beelzebub, who's the Lord of the Flies. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah. And okay, the thing it's about... It's funny because like, yeah. later, later they do a thing where the other guy that's calling Azura uh, Crowley is the Lord of the Files. Yes. <laughs> and I thought that was so funny as hell. Dig on Lord of the God. Files. That is a pretty fun thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, the thing about Beelzebub is that back in like 2019 or something, right? Like someone asks Neil on Tumblr, hey, what are Beelzebub's pronouns? And Why Neil, is he constantly on Tumblr? He's just... I mean, we should Get also ask why website, I bro. have read so many of his asks and whether this parasocial hate relationship is healthy. But yeah, the real <laughs> question is, why is he always on Tumblr answering those damn asks instead of, like, doing something of substance? But yeah. <laughs> anyway. And he said, like, Zir, like z- like Z I R, but like with a lot of Z's, and it's just like a joke about how like Beelzebub has flies, enunciates like z sounds in their name. Later, right, like at like various conventions and things, like 
people like the actors Neil himself are using are using she her pronouns for Beelzebub right and then finally we get to like season two and it's like the first time Beelzebub gets referred to with a pronoun and the pronoun used is they I just if you're gonna like make a stupid joke about neo pronouns and then like like okay fucking follow through bro (laughs) that's what I think like like, even in, like, the world of, like, fiction podcasts where, like, non-binary characters aren't, like, super missing the way that they are in other media. Like, I feel like I still haven't met a character who uses Neos and, like... And the thing is, even if this was true, I think there could be a way where you could incorporate this into the... Like, it can be, like, a joke, but, like, still, still like, a sincere thing. Yeah, you know what I mean? I get what you like, mean. Like, there could be a way to walk that tightrope. So, like, it's not impossible to do. Yeah, I agree, but, like, Neil Gaiman did not do it. Like, yeah. Yeah, didn't even attempt to walk it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just, like, it was nice for a while to, like, be able to read fan fictions where, like, Z pronouns were, like, used for, like, a semi-major character pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. But, like, like, even if it arose from, like, a dumb joke. But, like, yeah, he didn't even, he didn't even try. He didn't even try. He was just, like, well, close enough, right? Like, all the non-binaries are the same, right? And then he just slapped a they-them on Beelzebub after the she hurrying at cons and stuff. And... Yeah, I don't know. It's a shitty thing to do. I'm annoyed about it. I don't know. I think that usually when I'm talking to my friends about the show, I use, like, the Z pronouns for Beelzebub just, like, out of spite. I think I'm not certain what I'm gonna do in the podcast, but uh, we'll see. Um, oh, right. Funny moment during the hell thing. Like, Crowley's like, oh yeah, he's growing up to be so evil. It's, like, great. And then Ligger immediately goes, Has, has he, he killed, killed anyone yet? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, No. No. Like, you know, baby steps. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's very. What, what, what is the specific thing he said that the it's kid like, was doing? Just like, he's remarkable and he's super evil. Um, and later he's like, But there's like more to evil than just killing people, right? And everyone just, like, stares at him like he's a weirdo. Also, like, Crowley's hair, like, this whole time has been long, which I really appreciate. Once we get to the present, present day, he chops it off, and it's, like, the most miserable thing that's ever happened to my eyes. But, like, currently it's long, and he has it, like, half up? What's the name of that style where, like, you, like, take the front part that's in front of your ears and you, like, tie it back behind you in a ponytail, but the rest of your hair is down. Oh, it's like a half pony. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's his hair right now, and it's great. I wish he never changed it. I was actually severely disappointed when I, when the chop we happened. got to present I know. and the hair is chopped. I know. Cause, I don't know, because I assumed, because... You know, he has long hair pretty much this entire episode. And I just assumed that, like, season one, this is the hair. Yeah. And season two, it's gonna God, be short. God, I wish. No, I am made me so sad. Yeah, this is the worst act of transphobia Neil Gaiman has ever committed. Yeah. Ugh, God, that's yeah. not true. I saw some parts of, like, his <laughs> earlier comics and, like... He had a comic where there was, like, a serial killer convention and one of them talked about how, like... His favorite type of, like, person to kill was pre-op trans women. Like, what the fuck was that about? Anyway, so, um, meanwhile, in heaven, as, as you've already mentioned before, Xerophil's, like, he's basically, like, in the giving a PowerPoint presentation stance, except there's no PowerPoint presentation, which I think is adorbs, and... You know, he's like, you know, I I really think the Antichrist is being influenced towards the light. And Heaven's just like, okay, cool, but, like, you're gonna fail, so, like, it's nice that you're trying, but whatever. And also, one of the angels, I think Michael, says, like, wars are meant to be won, not avoided. 
well, they're saying goodbye. One of the angels uh, goes. Um, yeah, uh, Gabriel goes. Climb every mountain. Yeah, as the Almighty likes to say, climb every mountain. Climb every mountain. And, like, the thing is, it's both a reference to the sound. Like, you can say that, like, it's not a reference to the sound of music yet. But it can be a reference to when um, Crowley was like, you you can climb every mountain over and over again. Mm-hmm. So, it, like, it's already, like, you can already see that Aziraphale's face, like, falls a little bit. And, he, and he's like, uh-oh. And then, like, yeah. the next and line then, is yeah, another Sand angel Dolphin going. comes in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was like for every uh, for every stream. Yep, yep. And I about just about fucking lost it. Like I started <laughs> sc- like scream it's laughing by time. myself. I mean, like after this scene, Azuravil kind of starts becoming a lot more nervous. Yeah, like he like Crowley and him have this conversation of like, what if what if we fail? What what happens? And then Crowley's like, well, I guess. It's Jover. Um, the end is it's about to come. It's Jover. And like you can see that Azurafal's face is like he's so worried, he's worried sick. Mm. And it's so funny to think that the thing that made him <laughs> this worried about the end <laughs> was that the fucking angels are referencing the sound of music. Yeah. He fucking hates that show so much yeah. it's unreal. Yeah. Uh, also, I think a, a fun costume design thing with the angels is... Okay, first they're all in, like, these, like, severe gray suits. Except Sandolphin, who's in, like, a tan suit. But, like, they all have, like, gold accents on their face. Like, uh, Uriel has, like, a lot of, like, gold makeup on their face. And, like, they look really great. And then Sandolphin, when he, like, says for to every stream, you see that he has a gold tooth. So, I don't know. Fun stuff. What's I uh, know what's what's Aziraphale's gold? He does accent? not have one as far as we're aware, but he does wear a gold ring that I think is supposed to be heaven affiliated. So, I don't know, it'd be nice if that was I don't know if he has a gold mark that he's like covering or I think Neil Gaiman has referred to the marks as like more of a fashion thing than like part of the actual that, angelic yeah. form so it's just like Aziraphale's like that loser who like isn't trendy right now because everyone else has their gold shit on anyway um we go to six days before the end of the world you're back in hell um these two demons are checking on a hellhound Mm -hmm. and it's just like you know a giant dog that they keep in a room and they were like you think it's like you know beastly enough and they send him some guy i don't know if this is like a soul just a soul there or like a demon or whatever and they send him inside and they're like watch out for the teeth and then you know the beast ravages this poor guy Mm -hmm. and they were like well we did tell him that you know to watch out for the teeth if he didn't do it it's not our fault yeah that is a god they're kind of horrible i love that yeah yeah. I will say, though, that, like, I feel like this is fine as a one-off, but, okay, the demon who gets sent in, um, his name is Eric the Disposable Demon, and, like, there's, like, a bunch of forms of him, and he pops up a lot throughout the show, and he is mostly just there to get comically killed, and, like, there <laughs> okay. aren't that many, is, there is aren't it, that- get tiresome at some point? It's less than like it's tiresome than, like, like, I feel like Good Omens is, like- we did race blind casting and that makes us cool but like i feel like sometimes you should maybe consider who you're putting in what roles <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 regarding yeah. race because eric is played by a black man and yeah as you mentioned most of the people on this show are white so yeah i feel like when we i feel like we'll get into race and casting more when we get to the four horsemen of the apocalypse i feel like that's an yeah, I don't know. There's Crowley and Ezra Fail are just seated on a bench watching. Yeah, and they're actually sitting Warlock like closer to each mom. other this time. Yeah, they're meeting in the middle. Yeah, and like there's this bit where um, Crowley is like, "Oh yeah, 
I mean, there's going to be a hellhound a tree on Wednesday. <laughs> and then Zerubel is like, there's going to be a what? Like, this has never been mentioned to me before. And Crowley is just like, oh yeah, there's going to be a hellhound. And it's going to start the big, be- it's going to mark the beginning of Armageddon when he names the dog. Yeah. And in the book, Crowley didn't know about it until the day before because Hell just called him about it. But it is funny how in the show it's just like, oh yeah, I knew the whole time. I just forgot. Also, he tells Aziraphale that, like, well, he suggests at first, and Aziraphale doesn't get it. But asen- but eventually, he does tell the angel that, like, maybe you should just kill the guy. <laughs> maybe you should just kill the kid. And, you know, Aziraphale is against this because he's never killed anyone or anything, really. Yeah, but he never suggests that Crowley do it, which I think is nice. Yeah. During this scene, we we get the first time that Crowley calls Aziraphale Angel. Um, because Aziraphale's... What? I mean, that is his... That is his, um, creature name, but... Yes, it's, but... It's, it's, it's sweet. Yeah. It's sweet. It is very sweet. I feel like sometimes it comes off as more about talking about his species, and sometimes it comes off as just, like, a cute little nickname. And, okay, so the specific thing about the Hellhound is, like, um, once the kid names the Hellhound, it gives the Hellhound its purpose, and then that's when Armageddon starts. And if Crowley and Aziraphale were able to balance out influences correctly, then the kid will see the Hellhound, not feel drawn to it, and then send it away without a name, and then Armageddon can't start. So, like, that's the mechanics of it. It's supposed to come during his 11th birthday party, so both of them decide that they have to spy on the party, and Aziraphale starts getting yeah. really excited about the possibility of being a magician at the party. Yeah, and like, he does this thing where he like, takes out the coin, mm-hmm. and then it falls on the floor, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, wait, 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 and then he like, puts his hand behind um, Crowley's ear and takes out the coin, and he's like, ah, oh, it came from your ear, and the whole time Crowley's just like, Jesus like, fucking this Christ, this is so man. embarrassing, bro, <laughs> you're being so cringe so right now. so affiliating. Yeah. yeah, I love to, to think that like, at some point in history, when Aziraphale like started getting into this, Crowley, Crowley being like, "Oh, this is horrible," <laughs> and then like years and years and years and years later, it's still happening. Yeah, I yeah. love that. I mean, it has been. It's very very fun, right? It ends with what yeah. like Crowley like muttering, "I'll make you disappear," <laughs> when Aziraphale's talking about disappearing the <laughs> no. coin. I mean, there's, there's, cause like, you know, he's an angel, so he can just do yeah. things, yeah. but he doesn't cause he thinks the illusion of magic is so much more fun wow, to do. Wow, he's just like Sam Winchester. <laughs> he's just like Sam Winchester, for real. Sorry, that wasn't fair anyway, to Aziraphale. He does. <laughs> but Sam's not too bad yeah. of a guy to be he, compared with. He goes and does the magic act in the party, and he fucks it up. Quite severely. He looks stupid as hell in there. <laughs> He's drawn a sharpie mustache on himself. I love that. And, you know, the kids tell him that he's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> they don't say. And probably. <laughs> uh, a faggot, and, but they yeah. don't. They cut out the most important line in the entire book. I'm devastated. Exactly. The thing is, like, mm-hmm. the funniest thing about this is, okay, like, Good Omens, the TV show, is, like, a fun experiment in, like, what if you wrote a book in 1990 and you said some shitty things in there, and then in 2019 you had the chance to, like, unsay some of those shitty things. Which ones would you pick? And the other thing about Good Omens is that there's a radio show from, like, 2014? I've listened to it. I just forgot if it was from 2014 or 2015, where Neil Gaiman was also faced with this choice. And in 2014 or 2015, he said, I'm keeping faggot in. And then four years later, he went, you know what? I've reconsidered. What happened in the middle, Neil Gaiman? He met demonified. Sorry, I didn't hear that. What? I said he met demonified. 
Do you know about that Matt Damon thing where like randomly oh! in an interview completely unprompted he just goes I've stopped saying the F slur. <laughs> My daughter was really upset when I said it and she sat me down and we had a really nice conversation and you know what I get it now I'm not saying it anymore. God, I forgot that was Matt Damon. Completely That's hilarious. Unprompted. Because like yeah. yeah, in the podcast Greater Boston like there's a fictional Matt Damon. He's treated as, like, a pretty good guy. It's, like, Ben Affleck that, like, they hate on a lot. But you're right. Matt Damon did say that. <laughs> Hilarity. I mean, at least, like, he doesn't say it anymore, I guess. <laughs> God, didn't Casey Crazy. Musgraves, like, after getting her Emmy or, like, around the time of her getting her... Sorry, why did I say Emmy? Around the time of getting her Grammy... She, like, unprompted was like, oh, yeah, I also used to say it as an insult, but I don't anymore. Like, I don't know. What do people, like, do they think that, like, saying this will absolve them of their guilt? Like, I don't know. Sometimes you just keep that shit to yourself, bro. It was entertaining to hear. <laughs> That's true. I, it was pretty funny. That... No, I, I think maybe there is, like, a whole, like, if I say it, and then the people who, like, like, you know, it's like weeding out the people who would get mad at you if you... I, I, I can... For, for saying that, like, oh, you shouldn't say stuff like this. Okay, I get the you idea of, like, appealing to the maybe... audience of people who still say it as, like, a hey, don't anymore. But, like, I was that... Yeah. I don't think that was really the vibe I got from Matt Damon. Yeah, I think Matt Damon was just really proud of him. <laughs> yeah, he was like, I did a really good job. He's so like my parents, for real. I mean, they don't say the F-slur because they don't know the F-slur. But, like, like every year, unprompted, they're like, aren't we so much better at, like, like gay rights than we used to be? And I'll be like, no. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Anyway, um, they start throwing cake at Aziraphale because yeah. he was so bad at the magic. <laughs> and the kids are having fun. Yeah. Anyway, the hound gets released into the world. And because it has super senses or whatever, it knows that the Antichrist is not, in fact, Warlock, but is, in fact, Adam. Yep. I mean, Adam, Adam like, as we've said earlier, seems to be a nice kid. He's playing in the fucking forest or whatever. They, they called, like, his group of friends called themselves the Damned. That This is the future liberals want. Yeah, this is literally the future liberals want. And it already occurred in 2019. Adam is just talking about how much he wants a dog for his birthday and all that crap. Yeah, Pepper has a, a woman moment, which was sure something um where she says like oh i wanted like a uh, like a cool bike with like gears and like a razor saddle for my birthday but instead my parents got me a girl's bike with a basket and like no cool things whatsoever and then wensleydale goes but you are actually a girl and then she goes that's just sexist and ah uh, i just why can't Neil Gaiman, like, write women? Like, there are women in his life. <laughs> like, he's a he's a people women. in this world. He can just write women like people in this world. It'd be cool. And, like, I think the annoying part is, in the book, the line is, she goes, like, that's just sexist, giving someone girly presents because they're a girl. And, like, when I read that, I was like, okay, like, She's being portrayed as making a reasonable point, but, like, like what this adaptation tells me is, like, oh, no, it's because, like, when they wrote it in 1990, they thought that her original statement was, like, ridiculous and stupid, so, like, now they're just cutting it down to, like, give it the same tone of it being ridiculous and stupid. And the fact that this version is so, like, did you just assume my pronouns? You know what I mean? Like, it's sexist to call her a girl is, like, the joke now. And, like, I don't know. I think yeah. I have a, a special sensitivity towards that because, like, did you just assume my pronouns was, like, 
the hot new joke at my high Ooh, school in 10th yeah. grade and it made me feel so incredibly was. unsafe like every time I was anywhere in yes. school because it would just happen during That's every true. conversation so yeah i know not a fan it, it, it's like god that was a horrible time it was so and the thing bad. is like i lived in a very progressive high school mm-hmm. like people were very like a lot of people were gay a lot of people you know yeah and a lot of the people who were making these jokes were gay people like yeah like you're already queer and then you're just punching down because you don't think that like whatever whatever it's whatever mm-hmm. and it was you know very hurtful etc yeah yeah same experience here yeah i feel like me and like the one other trans kid around were like we've tried telling some people to not do it and it worked on some people but most of the time it was just like i'm having the most miserable year of my life i think for me the experience is because i mean i was out this you know queer but not trans Mm -hmm. and the experience is kind of like okay well and then like pushing back in the closet kind of situation yeah which you know also sucked but uh. yeah yeah man i don't even think i knew i was non-binary at the beginning of that year but i was like i don't think it helped me realize but definitely like i feel like some of the visceral uncomfortableness i didn't know where it was coming from until i was like hey what if we weren't a girl (laughs) Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Anyway. So, oh, you said you couldn't think of a worse line for a long time, but I That's feel like we found one. This could be it. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, the hellhound goes to Adam. And at this point, he still can't see the hellhound. And he starts naming the hellhound. And there's like a long suspense where he goes like, and I'll... Yeah, and if I, if I got a dog for my birthday, I think I would want him to be named Dog. And then he goes, Dog. And um, he also describes the kind of dog he wants. Because, yeah. like, at some point, like, some one of his friends go, like, do you want the Rottweiler? And he goes, no, like, I want a small dog who's, like, smart and all that crap. Yeah. And then the hellhound turns into this dog because it's the dog that Adam desired. Yeah, yeah. So, suddenly there's this dog and it's running to Adam and now he has a dog and the apocalypse is about to start. Yeah. It is so nice that he named the dog dog. God bless. Okay, right. Also, uh, before the scene, as we mentioned earlier, you know, Crowley is like in the car and Dagon, Lord of the Files, calls and is like, Oh, yeah, we released the dog, and it would definitely go to the right boy. So, um, hello? Is it there? And Crowley's like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, 100% for sure. And I think that's what I like about the scene is that, like, it also shows the limits of hell surveillance because they're talking to him through the radio. But, like, Aziraphale's in the car, and they have no idea, which means that, like, when they're talking to him through a purely audio medium, like, they can't actually see him in any way whereas i think in a later episode they talk to him via a tv and i think they can see him for that one so yeah another another cool detail but anyway we cut back to the bookstore and aziraphale and crowley are sitting there and drinking again um and you know crowley is just like this sucks. We've lost the Antichrist. Why did I have to get dragged into this anyway? It's horrible. And Aziraphale has another great bitchy moment where he's like, well, I think maybe the reason is because you kept sending them memos about how you were so good that you started the Spanish Inquisition <laughs> and World War II. And yeah. Crowley's like, okay, first, not my fault that they never check up. Like, who cares? And secondly, like, humans beat me to it, so, like, that's not my fault. Like, I totally could have done it myself if I wanted to. Ugh, he's such a silly little guy. And then he sniffs the air and he goes, like, oh, like, there's something different. And Aziraphale goes, oh, I have a new cologne. My barber suggested it. <laughs> and Crowley goes, no, I, I know, know what, what you, you smell, smell like. like. Insane moment. 
absolutely insane moment. What was the point of any of it? It is not in the book. But yeah, basically Crowley senses that wherever the Hellhound is has found the true Antichrist. And um, when Aziraphale doubts this, he goes, would I lie to you? And Aziraphale goes, well, obviously, you're a demon. That's what you do. Um, which, you know, it's just them doing their thing again. I really don't know how much either of them believe any of this shit. I feel like Crowley wouldn't say that sentence unless he thought it, like, would still register emotionally. And I think it does still register emotionally. I think Aziraphale just has, like, like, prejudice reflexes or whatever. But yeah, you know, Crowley ends with being like, okay, well, we're doomed. And Aziraphale goes, welcome to the end times. And, you know, that's the end of the episode. It's pretty fine. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty great. Yeah. Pretty great. Great. How would you rate this episode out of 10? Well, I mean, for a pilot. Mm. I am a firm believer that TV shows are not supposed to get you in the pilot. Mm -hmm. Like, give the first five episodes a go before making a judgment. I'm like that kind of person because I am like in full awareness that a lot of the times first seasons of shows are kind of horrible and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But obviously, Good Omens is a different kind of show than the ones that I usually watch. And... I think this pilot is actually really good because, mm -hmm. like, it fully engaged me. And honestly, I am quite sad that we'll have to wait a week to watch the next one. for the next recording. Yeah. yeah, for the next recording because I want to watch the whole season right now. Damn, like, I, it has interested me that much. So. Alas. Alas. Well, so I think for that, for the way it grabbed me, I would say this is a 10 out of 10 episode. Nice. For me, I mean, this is good. I get to meet my favorite little guys. Um, I think that sometimes the jokes are too obviously set up and that makes them less funny to me. Like, there's, like, a scene where, like, Pepper's like, oh, and this dog's just gonna appear out of nowhere, and then the dog appears, and it's like, yeah, and then it okay, did. whatever. Like, you don't have to say everything. Um, so I would ding a little for that. Um, but I feel like otherwise this is, I mean, you're right, it's a good pilot. So I'll give it a 9 out of 10. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. That's it for this week's episode of Rubbish and Probably a Podcast. Next time, we will be talking about Season 1, Episode 2, The Book. Leave us a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media. We interact through the account set up for our Supernatural Commentary Podcast, Bus Asian Beauties. So catch us on Tumblr at bustasianbeautyspod.tumblr.com and email us at bustasianbeautyspod at gmail.com. Thanks to everyone who's donated to our Kofi at ko-fi.com slash pod. See you guys next time. Bye. Bye. I'm eating my Snickers almond brownie, dark chocolate. Wait, it's a Snickers brownie? Yeah, it's what? a Snickers it's... almond brownie and dark chocolate square. Like, that's the flavor of it? Or like it's actually a brownie yeah. with Snickers in it? No, it's like a Snickers brand almond brownie. Huh. And it's covered in dark chocolate. That sounds pretty good. Yeah, it's way too sweet. You know, do you know that joke with the like, what is it? What is it you can't face? No, what? Like, there's like an internet meme where, what's the name of the main character in Sound of Music? 
Um, Maria? Yeah, so Maria goes back to the convent. And she's like, oh, I can't do it anymore, blah, blah, blah. And one of the nuns were like, Maria, this is, the convent is not a place for hiding. What is it, what is it you can't face? But like, because they're fucking Austrian or whatever, the accent uh-huh. makes it sound like she's calling her a cunt face. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. I don't think I noticed that at age like nine or whatever, though. <laughs> <laughs> 